Hi, so in this video I'm going to demo change tracking and just to clarify, change tracking is different from change data capture. So if you're looking for change data capture, definitely check out some of my other videos on uh, change data capture CDC. So let me begin here by creating a change tracking database. So I'm going to do that by executing these statements. And once that's done, let me refresh the database here and you'll see that's the database I'm going to be using. And it's empty right now and I'm going to create three uh, tables here. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I, I want to demonstrate the change versions and how they differ from table to table if you're doing a transaction that spans multiple tables. So uh, I have three different tables here which I'm going to call tracking table 1, tracking table 2, and tracking table 3. And they have identical rows, basically identical column definitions. So let me go ahead and create that. So I'm going to create these tables. And now what I'm going to do is I am going to populate it with a bunch of rows. So for the first table, tracking table 1, I'm going to name it with a, a prefix of A, tracking table 2, prefix of B, and tracking table 3, a prefix of C. So I'm going to do this all in one transaction. And notice right now, I am not tracking any changes as of this point. I am, these are just normal tables. I actually have to activate change tracking. So in order to do that, I am going to activate it right here with this statement. And I'm going to retain the changes for 14 days and do auto cleanup. So let me go ahead and execute this statement. And now I actually have change tracking activated on my uh, database and you could actually do that on the UI also by right clicking and clicking properties on the database and you'll see there's a change tracking here and you'll notice all the parameters that I've specified in that statement right here is also available in this window so you could also do it through the UI uh, same thing with uh, enabling change tracking on the tables. So here I am enabling change tracking and for the first table I am going to track the columns that are changed whereas on the other two tables I'm going to set those to off. So let me go ahead and execute that statement and you'll notice if I refresh my tables here and once again on the GUI, if I click on one of the tables and I click properties, there's actually a change tracking property. And you'll see here, I have the tracking of the columns on for the first table. And for the second table, I have the tracking as false off. So you could also do that through the UI and that's how you access the UI properties. And now that I have those now that I have those uh, tables activated with change tracking, these change tracking functions work uh, by querying the version number. So the version number starts with zero and every time I make a change now it's going to increment. So the first thing I'm going to do here is uh, run, run my query here and you'll notice I am just grabbing the data that's in the tables. So I have five rows each. The, ta the uh, initial data that I inserted. And if I run my change tracking here, and I'm going to start with the version number of zero, it's going to come back with empty rows because I actually don't have any changes. So let me start making changes. And the first thing I'm going to do here is uh, each I'm going to do an insert and I'm going to insert rows of ID 6 into each table. So if you remember, in my original tables I have 5 rows each and I'm going to insert a 6th. So I am going to execute this first statement. And the, these are implicit transactions if I run it at once because it's not within a transaction statement. So if I run this, you'll notice now that I look at the changes that I have, and you'll notice the way to access the changes is through this function here. So I have this change table function where I specify the table 
and then the version number which here I specified as zero so I'm gonna run this here and I'm gonna run this with every change just to show you what's going on so in the first table so this this here this row here is the query for the first table these queries here is for the second table and third table so if I run it for the three tables you notice the first one comes back with the change and the last column is an ID of six and it is a operation of I which is insert and the version number is one and let me go ahead and execute the other two so I'm going to execute the next two and you'll notice if I run this again to see what changes occurred I now have version one version two and version three so you'll see once again it inserted row sixes to each one of the tables so if I look at all the data in the table you see now there's six rows now that you'll notice every time I made a change here it incremented the version number by one so it started out with one and my second insert here was the two and my third insert here was the three now I'm gonna do a transaction where I'm gonna insert three rows basically under one transaction so when I do that you'll notice it's going to be version 4 across all three rows so one thing you have to remember about this change tracking version is notice now this is version 4 and the each one of these rows is the ID of 7 the ID of 7 the ID of 7 and what that stands for is the primary key in the tables that I've created and uh, one thing I forgot to mention before was that your your tables must have primary keys for change tracking to track the changes so uh, that is just uh, one of the requirements of using change tracking on a table so there you go that is um, the first demo of the change where uh, just keep in mind the, the point of this little example was the transactions uh, share one version number and once again in this case it shared the version number of four and they were inserts inserts and inserts now um, what I'm going to do here in in the second demo second uh, change set of changes that I'm going to do is I am going to do run this and you'll notice uh, the version numbers that I have I'm going to start with greater than version zero so let me run that and you'll notice once again it's a transaction so it shares the version number across the board and it has an ID of 8 here which is the rows I added which all had an ID of 8 now I'm, I'm gonna do something a little bit different here where I, I am actually gonna update the rows and notice um, I have a, I, a version of 5 so keep that in mind when when uh, I do this demo is after I inserted this th that that was a version of five now I'm gonna do an update on the two rows that I just inserted basically uh, all of these rows all six of these rows or uh, better yet if I select up here all six of these rows this one this one this one this one and these last two so so remember I previously inserted those and now I'm gonna update it and let's see what happens now I am gonna query for all the changes since version 0 and you notice what went on here is I don't see any symbol for updates why is that it's, it's because it gives me a consolidated view of the changes so the property of this function is that it gives me a consolidated change of everything from version 0 but remember I, I said I did to, to remember the version of 5 so if I query all the changes from 5 what you will notice is that the updates actually show up now so now I have the two updates 
that correspond to basically up updating uh, these two rows here. So seven and eight, seven and eight. So notice, um, def def definitely keep that in mind that the context or the view that you see depends on the version, the change version that you pass in. So if, if I wanted to synchronize my data in another database and my previous synchronization was version zero as before, then I'm just grabbing everything. But if my previous synchronization was five, then this is the view I would see. Uh, because presumably I've already applied all the other changes. So just definitely keep that in mind uh, when you're doing this. And I am just gonna demonstrate the rest of this by running the deletes also. So you'll notice if I go by version five again, you'll notice um, I do have a delete of the version eight. Now if, if I wanted to see a view from the first ever version and I pass in zero, you'll notice I do have the deletes of the one I have here because it was inserted previously. So definitely keep that in mind when you're doing these changes. Now, now you, you may wonder here is, you know, why does it have the delete of the ID8 row and not the insert of the one? Now, keep, keep in mind that it does not store the actual changes. It only stores what, what operation happened. So if I was to query for ID8, I wouldn't find it. So what you have here is it'll record the operation that the eight happened, but if it actually showed an insert of eight, I would never be able to query for that row in the first place, which is why it doesn't have the uh, indication that the 8 existed but does have the indication that the 8 was deleted if that makes sense uh, because keep in mind in the real data the 8 is now gone and there's no way for me to retrieve that data when I join it with this table which is typically what you would do is join the real table with this select statement here to get the changes of the values and I'll demonstrate that later on here. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to show was that uh, if you remember here when I activated the change tracking you'll notice on the first table I turned on the track up column updates so you'll notice here I have the column updates here on table 1 but not on table 2 and not on table 3. And that function, you, you can use a function here to determine which column was changed. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. Uh, now to go back down here. Um, the, other th the other aspect I wanted to point out was the change context. So you'll notice here, there's a column here called change context. And that is a var binary. I, I believe it's 128 bytes or something like that. And you could put in whatever data you want to indicate what uh, to indicate whatever uh, you want to indicate. So, for example, here I want to indicate this change that I'm doing next is based on a server change versus a client changing it. Uh, so I I can actually put in a value here. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to put in a value, and remember the value is a var binary, so I'm going to put in a string, and then I'm going to have to convert back and forth to retrieve the value. And I'm only going to do it for table 1, and not for table 2 or table 3. So let me go ahead, execute this, and if I run it now, you'll notice now I have this value here in the sys change context but not in these other tables 
Also notice that even when I don't change anything, simply running a statement, if I'm setting basically uh, the value to itself, well, it still would appear in the change tracking tables. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, and I want, and I did mention before that typically you do joins. So I'm going to do a join here with the change tracking version and with, with the change tracking changes to the real tables. And this, this whole example you can find in the description area. I'll be posting this in the description area. So you'll notice um, what I'm doing here is I'm joining the real table with the function to get the changes which I will try to synchronize, uh, for example, with uh, another database or with another client or produce files with. So you'll see, you know, that's the technique that you use in order to do that. Um, but that's really it. Uh, that's all I wanted to show. And I hope this, uh, you know, it might be a little bit confusing at first, but definitely run through the example that I'm going to put in the description area. and. Uh, hopefully when you do it yourself, it'll be a little bit more clear and uh, hope this video helped and uh, thank you for watching